right. So we are starting with uh, group 17 now. There's a few things that we know about them from O levels. Like uh, we know that there is uh, this group 17 in the broad table. We used to call it group seven in O levels. And it has fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine. They're all five diatomic substances. Okay. So they always, we usually call them X. So we denote them by X. X means halogen, group 17. And they all exist as diatomic, which means that they always exist as uh, X2. So F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, At2. Okay. And there's always a single covalent bond between them. They are all sharing one electron with each of them. And usually they have these three lone pairs. Okay. And uh, they are very volatile. They're all very volatile. They're all very poisonous. And uh, the configuration is pretty straightforward. Uh, all of them, if you notice, they will have P5 at the end. So this one, 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. This one, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. And this one all the way to 4p5. And this one all the way to 5p5. And no wonder acetine will be 6p5. Okay, so this p5 thing is important because this is what's give them the placement in the periodic table that they have five electrons in the last shell, in the last subshell. And they need just one more. And they're just one electron shy from becoming like noble gases. And so that makes them really, really reactive. Now, as I told you that they have these six lone pairs and uh, down the group, obviously you're going to get more and more protons. So more protons for neutral atom means more electrons. So fluorine has uh, nine as its uh, proton number, which means it has nine electrons. F2 will have 18 electrons. Chlorine has 17 protons in one atom. So that is 34 electrons in one chlorine molecule. So down the group, the number of these electrons in the cloud increases, okay? So which basically means that number one, you're getting a bigger molecule. And number two, you're getting more electrons in the molecule. Now with more electrons in the molecule, what happens is that you can polarize it more. You can push more electrons away, creating a dipole. So there's this cloud of things and in this cloud, there's more electrons, which means the electrons, if I bring a negative thing here, it will push these electrons to the side, giving a more positive charge on this side. And these are basically, we represent these as dipoles. Okay, so this is de delta negative, this is delta positive. So if one molecule comes close to another one, it is going to create temporary instantaneous induced dipoles on it, which means that the van der Waals forces are going to be stronger why? Because you have more electrons. So down the group, there's more electrons in the cloud. There's more polarization. So down the group, that's the first trend we are looking at. So down the group, more electrons in the cloud. So there is more polarization, which creates stronger dipoles or stronger attraction between these instantaneous dipoles. Okay, instantaneous dipoles, instantaneous dipoles. And that means boiling point, melting point, density, all of these things increase. Sir, doesn't group seven have um, permanent dipoles? Why would it? F is attached to another F. There is no difference in electronegativity. Oh, okay. okay. So it wouldn't have, uh, it will have induced dipoles as a pure substance. So that's it. Now, that's the first trend. That's the first trend we have. So no wonder fluorine is, uh, fluorine and chlorine are both gases at room temperature. Bromine is uh, liquid at room temperature, although it boils, I think, at 60 degrees Celsius. And then iodine boils uh, around 200. exact value. That's how it does. The boiling point increases. The melting point increases as you go down. Uh, another thing, their appearance, uh, their color darkens. So fluorine is yellow. So that's how they are. This is yellow gas. This is yellow green gas. So we don't say yellowish or greenish. It is yellow green gas. This is red brown liquid. This is almost black. Blue black is also a term we use sometimes. 
blue black solid and of course nobody has really observed it astatine in large enough quantity to know its color because it's super radioactive it breaks down really rapidly into other things this will be we can expect it to be black if we get a large enough quantity of this thing okay now here are some values that we'll try to understand the trend of so again we are concerning ourselves with chlorine chlorine bromine bromine and iodine iodine okay and then i'm also going to talk about hcl hbr and hi for a bit so here's the bond length okay so this is sorry bond energy so this is 242 this is 193 and this is 151 and this one is 431 366 299 okay so let's look at this first what's happening is that the bond energy is decreasing can you think of a reason why that is the case why would bond energy decrease as it goes down so bond energy what does it come from so here's a rough diagram i have uh, this atom of x this atom of x they're both sharing an electron pair this is pulling on it and so is this one what's happening here is that the attraction from iodine is weaker compared to the attraction from chlorine is there a reason that should be the case is it due to the atomic radii of the it is yeah yeah, yeah. exactly so yeah so what is the trend in atomic radii what is the trend it increases down the group which very means... good it increases down the group because we're adding another shell which means that this shared pair of electrons it's further away from the nucleus in fact both the nuclei so no wonder it's difficult to pull on that from a nucleus perspective which is why bond energy decreases downwards so if they want to gain electrons to be more stable what implication does it have on the reactivity so my question is that down the group how does this affect the reactivity of these things. So would the reactivity increase? It would decrease because they want to gain electrons. They are oh. oxidizing agents, the, all of them. Wait, so can you explain this again? I don't understand. Okay, so down the group, atoms are becoming bigger and the electrons that they're sharing is obviously in the last shell. So it's getting further and further away from the nucleus. So no wonder it's difficult to pull on that. The bond energy decreases. The Energy required to break a bond is what bond energy is. You need less energy to break the bond if it's a bigger atom or a bigger molecule. And that is because attraction from the nuclei decreases as you go down the group. Do you understand now? So, so that makes them more reactive down the group. Less reactive. Because, okay, so number one, bond energy, we have already explained that that depends on atomic radii becoming bigger and bigger. The attraction is weaker, which is why you need less energy to break the bond. Now, these things want to gain an electron, which means they want to form negative ion, which means they want to gain electron. Now, as the electron at the shell in which they want the electron to be, as it goes further and further away from the nucleus, the effective nuclear charge decreases. And obviously there's extra shielding as well. So that is why they become less reactive. Again, atomic size increases, shielding increases, nuclear charge decreases. It's difficult to gain electron. So it's two things that are related. Down the group, uh, atomic radii increases, shielding effect increases, effective nuclear charge decreases, which means that uh, these electrons that are in the last shell are held less strongly, okay? Weaker attraction, lower attraction. So lower attraction of shared pair, and also the ability to gain electrons. So lesser ability to gain electron, which means this are, all of this can be translated to they have lower electronegativity. And because of this thing, they become less reactive. Okay, so reactivity decreases. So does bond energy. So two things explained by the same argument. If I ask you, which one is the most like the strongest oxidizing agent in all of them, what would it be? What's an oxidizing agent? It's something that, that accepts electron, okay? So things that are more reactive as a non-metal accept electrons faster 
This is from O levels. So chlorine is most reactive. It will attract electron more strongly, which means out of these three, it's the best oxidizing agent. Uh, obviously, chlorine will be that, and bromine is less stronger or weaker oxidizing agent, and iodine is even weaker oxidizing agent. Now, let's talk about this one. This is bond energy of hydrogen and these halogens. So, what's happening here? Number one, let's see how this is formed. Usually, if I take hydrogen and I react it with chlorine, so hydrogen plus chlorine, it basically explodes. Okay, there's an explosion. It's highly exothermic reaction. And uh, you will need ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet light because ultraviolet light allows chlorine bonds to be broken. But with bromine, that doesn't happen. In fact, with bromine, we have to heat it up. Again, do you understand why that would be? It is because bromine is less reactive than chlorine. And bromine can pull on hydrogen less strongly than chlorine can. And lastly, we have... Iodine reacting with it. And can you see why this is the least uh, volatile reaction or why this is such a slow reaction? Do you see why that is? The reaction is reversible, which means it never goes to completion. So iodine is not that reactive compared to them. So you see a trend in their reactivity. There's an explosion here and this needs to be heated. And this is slow, obviously. And this is reversible. Even after you heat it, in the bond energy values, you can clearly see that the bond energy values are 431, 366, 299, which means the HX bond down the group, HX bond weakens. Okay. Now, these are all gases, okay? HCl is a gas, HBi is a gas, HI is a gas at room temperature. And they're all colorless. Bromine is not colorless, but HBr is colorless. Hydrogen chloride is colorless. Now, looking by the judging by the bond strength, these bond energy values, these ones, can you tell me which one of these is going to be most reactive compound? Again, Say HCl. No, interestingly, it's not HCl. It's the other way. It is HI that is the most reactive. Sir, but then if it's the most explosive, so doesn't that mean that it's more reactive? What's more reactive? Chlorine is more reactive because chlorine explodes with hydrogen, not HCl. Why is chlorine more reactive? Because chlorine breaks the bond with other chlorine and binds with hydrogen right away. But iodine doesn't do that, so iodine is less reactive. Now, if you want HCl to react with something, we will need to break the bond of HCl, right? Turns out, HI bond, hydrogen and iodine bond, that is the easiest to break. Two reasons. But actually, it's the same argument as this one. I have HCl sharing an electron with hydrogen, and I have hydrogen sharing an electron with iodine, electron pair iodine. The bond length is much larger, which means the bond strength is also weaker. So it's easier to break this bond. It's easier to break the hydrogen iodide bond compared to hydrogen chloride, which means if you dissolve them in water, HCl will give H positive away because water may get out Water may you have lone pairs of oxygen looking for any delta positive hydrogen. So this lone pair readily attacks it. And chlorine is not willing to lose that. Itna zyada, compared to the same thing happening part with iodine. When same thing happens with iodine, iodine is more than ready to just leave that hydrogen away. Wo foreign usko chhod deta, compared to HCl. Of course, compared to ethanoic acid, in dono bahut hi strong hai as an acids, but still between them, each I is a stronger acid than HCl. Why? Because each I is, it has low bond energy, larger bond length. 
So everything is working in the favor of hydrogen ion going away from it. Similarly, H I is thermally less stable than HCl. Why? Because the bond is break bond breaks at very low energy compared to HCl. H I is a stronger acid because it loses H positive away very easily. Why? Atoms are bigger, bond length is bigger, bond energy is low. वो जल्दी आई इसको छोड़ देगा. It is less stable. Of course, it will be less stable. You need just a small amount of energy to break its bond. If I heat hydrogen chloride, for example, HCl doesn't break down if I heat it. But if I heat, let's suppose HBr, it does break down, but in a reversible reaction. and gives me hydrogen and bromine obviously i will see a color change when that happens okay slightly brown color will be formed and then when hi breaks down it fully breaks down so you see how this breakdown reaction is exact opposite of how they were actually formed like over here the thing that forms most readily doesn't decompose that readily kyunki uski bond itni strong hai ki wo wapas jana nahi chahta but hydrogen iodide was very reluctant to be made so the moment it was given the chance to break down it broke it converted back and you will see a purple color why because iodine is purple and this one you will see brown red brown uh gas why is it gas because you're heating it so do you see how halogen is different from halide halide is the ion halide is the thing that is made after the reaction a halogen that is more reactive is a less reactive halide a halogen that is less reactive is a more reactive halide because it's more willing to lose that iodide or whatever and that brings me to the idea of oxidation and reduction for these things and obviously you to remember from o levels displacement principle displacement principle what was it a more reactive thing displaces a less reactive thing right in other words a more reactive a more reactive or a stronger oxidizing agent displaces a less stronger or a weaker oxidizing agent so if i take bromine and i add it to hydrogen iodide what will i see i will see that iodide simply loses that h positive because the bond is weaker and then hbr forms and iodine just goes away similarly if i were to take chlorine and i add it to same hbr hbr bond is bigger hbr bond is less stronger chlorine is a much stronger oxidizing agent chlorine will take that electron from bromine readily and form hcl and br2 goes away it's not just in molecular substances it's also going to happen if i took like ki potassium iodide i will see kbr form and a brown color being made or if i take the same kbr and i pass chlorine through it i will see kcl formed and br goes away but it's never going to happen the other way around iodide will never iodine will never displace bromide or chlor chlor chlorine oh uh, sorry iodine will never displace chloride because iodine is the weakest how do i know which halogen do i have so that's actually really easy with silver all of them form insoluble substances okay so if i take silver nitrate for example now does anybody know why we use silver nitrate and not some other substance it's because silver nitrate is always going to be soluble all nitrates are soluble so silver nitrate if i add it to water it will readily ionize to silver ion and nitrate ion now let's suppose i already have three beakers here and i do not know i do know that they all have some iodide or chloride or bromide but i do not know which one it is so what i do is i add some silver nitrate to all of them now silver nitrate dissolves and it creates this reaction silver ion reacts with halide ion to make agx which is insoluble which is solid so basically it forms a precipitate silver nitrate readily ionizes gives me silver ion that's a precipitate now i can use this precipitate to figure out what ion i had 
So silver chloride is white. You remember this from O levels, right? Silver bromide is uh, off white. We also call it cream. And silver iodide is yellow. But here's the thing, for example, uh, if you ask me, I've never been able to figure out that this is off white and this is yellow. Mujhe nazar nahi aata unke andar, kutna zafar. Yeah, with lead, the difference is much more uh, visible or distinguishable, but not with the uh, silver. Malab, in my experience, I have always had a bad time or a difficult time. So we can further react this thing. What we can do is we can add ammonia to this to be sure. So we add ammonia, ammonia solution, obviously. And what happens is that now this dissolves, but this only dissolves if I react it with concentrated ammonia. And this does not dissolve. Again, why does it dissolve and why it doesn't dissolve depends on the transition metal chemistry that we will study in A2. But for now, you can just see that if you're having a difficult time trying to figure out which of the salts you have, just dissolve them in ammonia. So with ammonia, AgCl will dissolve, but bromide will only dissolve with concentrated, which means it won't dissolve in dilute one. Okay. So that is how I know which salt we have or which ion we have. And that's easy. That's pretty simple test you can do to figure out what you have. So I have a picture of these over here. So but try to figure out this. So I have for some reason my computer is stuck. Process Tell me you see a difference in these colors. Sorry about that. Yeah. So do you see the difference? Yes. Or, yes. Kafi are a difference. So that's good. You are very uh probably. So this is again the same reaction, but with a darker background. With a lighter background, you can see that the differences are not that distinct, but with a darker background, it's much easier to distinguish. So whenever you're doing it in the lab and you want to figure out the color, a darker background helps. Okay. So you can see these colors. And uh, yeah, that is the way. So if you had to have a table of all of this that I just taught, taught you, you can just take this table. So here's the, the summary. The summary is that you add silver nitrate because silver forms a precipitate with them. And that precipitate is soluble with ammonia, uh, aqueous ammonia, dilute ammonia. But for bromide, it's only soluble in concentrated ammonia. And for iodide, it's not soluble at all. Now, there might be a couple of students here from A2 or students who are doing composite. So for those people only, here's the reason why this happens. So for example, if I had silver chloride, now silver chloride, it reacts with ammonia. And you know that silver has uh, its d orbital available to them. Like it's incomplete d orbital that silver ion has. So what happens is that ammonia has a lone pair, if you remember, that ammonia has a lone pair here. So what ammonia does is that because silver has an incomplete d orbital, this lone pair can go and make a dative bond with it. Okay. And that's what happens. So two ammonia molecules go and form a linear diamine complex with it. So that is a big word. It's a linear diamine complex. Let me write this down. Silver forms a linear, linear because silver is in the middle. There's ammonia, one ammonia, ammonia on one side and one ammonia on the other side. You should write them like this, that nitrogen is the one that's forming the dative bond. Okay. And uh, this ion that is positive, wait a minute, it would be positive one, not positive. Yeah, this is what is made when you have ammonia. And because this is a soluble thing in water, the compound dissolves or the precipitate dissolves. Okay. And the chloride goes away. And that's why you don't see a silver chloride. It just it simply dissolves because it was solid 
and this was aqueous, but now this thing is also aqueous and that's also aqueous. So no wonder it's going to do that. So this is a linear diamine complex, but this complex does not form with iodide or with concentrated ammonia. It's able to do that with bromine because bromide ion readily de de detaches and uh, ammonia is able to come in, but because of iodine being a much bigger atom, it's difficult for silver to detach in that way because it would repulsion. Okay. And that's why it doesn't form this. In the exam, they will not ask you why iodide uh, doesn't dissolve, but they might ask you why chloride dissolves, like silver chloride. Why does that dissolve? It is because it forms the linear diamine complex. But why doesn't iodide dissolve? They won't ask you about that. Okay, so that was the idea of these things being oxidizing agents. And because one is more reactive than the other, it can easily displace the other one, which means you can easily use them as oxidizing agents. What if I want to use them as reducing agents? What if I want halogens to lose electrons? Now that's a very difficult proposition. Halogens aren't going to do that, but halides might. Like if I took chloride ion, chloride already has an extra electron that it has taken from something else. So I could force it to lose that electron back. And we do that all the time with electrolysis. We can force them to lose that extra electron that they've acquired from something. Like I took sodium chloride and I do electrolysis of this. Chloride will convert to chlorine by losing that electron and sodium will convert to sodium atom by gaining that electron. So we can do that. But the ability to reduce, again, decreases down the growth. Okay. So, sorry, it increases because it's easier to lose electron, right? So down the growth, it's easier to lose electron and difficult to gain electron. So that's why fluorine is a very reactive oxidizing agent because fluorine readily takes the electron. But same fluoride, is very weak reducing agent because fluoride doesn't lose that electron. It doesn't want to. It doesn't want to give that electron away. Fluorine has the highest electronegativity in all of the periodic table. So fluoride ion doesn't want to lose that electron. So it's a very bad reducing agent. It's a weak reducing agent. Okay. Again, the reason comes from the same argument that we had somewhere here. Yeah. So can you explain this again? Yeah. So the idea is that when it comes to gaining electrons down the group, the ability decreases, right? So what about losing electron down the group? The ability increases. It's the opposite of that, right? So if it is difficult to gain electron down the group, it is easier to lose electron down the group. Things that lose electrons are reducing agents. Things that gain electrons are oxidizing agents. So down the group, they become weaker oxidizing agents. Why? Atomic radius increases, shielding increases, effective nuclear charge in decreases. So the attraction of shared pair is less. It's difficult to gain electron. But at the same time, it's easier to lose electron. So iodide ion will lose electron much readily compared to fluoride or chloride. Because chloride is a smaller ion compared to chlor of iodide, it's difficult to lose that electron for it. Okay, so that's why they are reducing agent. Their reducing ability decreases, increases down the group. Oxidizing ability decreases, reducing ability increases. If I had chlorine, so here's three reactions. Chlorine gaining electrons, making two chloride. Bromine taking two electrons, making two bromide and iodine taking two electrons, making two iodide. Okay, if I talk about the forward reaction, which of these is the fastest? One, two, or three, forward reaction. Which of them is the fastest? It's a pretty straightforward question. I want them to accept- First one. First one, yeah. First one is the fastest because chlorine is the most reactive. Chlorine has the smallest atom. It accepts the electron much more readily because the effective nuclear charge is the greatest, all of those things. So the first one is going to be the fastest forward reaction. 
but at the same time it's going to be the slowest backward reaction and third one is the fastest forward reaction or oh, sorry slowest forward reaction because iodine is a much bigger atom there is less effective nuclear charge more shielding and all that but at the same time it's the fastest backward reaction now forward reaction over here is when they're acting as oxidizing agent okay if something goes forward fast it's a good oxidizing agent because it's accepting electron from the other thing okay and if something goes fast backwards it's a good reducing agent because it gives electrons to that thing so basically down the group reducing ability increases because they're going backwards more and oxidizing ability decreases because they're accepting electrons less so it's just that if you understand that they're more reactive forward or they're more reactive down the group they're less reactive down the group at the same uh, up the group at the same time you get it so reduction and oxidation because they're opposite to each other so is for say ye hoga now there's two reactions of this but i already feel like ke bahut zyada ho gaya shayad aaj so tell me if you're comfortable i can go on no, <laughs> okay <laughs>